Welcome to another episode with Bill Chan. How great is this country? Someone like me, with the help of my friend Mike, I get to put together a few gadgets, I get on the air, and I get to say whatever the hell I want to say with no restriction. Such freedom of, of speech is not everywhere, and I do not take this lightly. It is a privilege. This is another good example as to why this country is so great. Tonight, I wanted to talk about a bit about my father and what it means for me to be a father, and I thought that, that would be a good segue into my guest tonight, a former Olympic fencer, Coach Bohan. I'm going to start with showing you this particular pencil sharpener right here. See that? Boston brand pencil sharpener. Imagine, this is a sturdy little machine made in Camden, New Jersey, made in USA. Here's a story. I was given one of these when I was 10 years old, about the time I was told that we were coming to America by my father. And believe, believe this, this is the only physical gift that my father ever gave it to me. 12 years in Korea and 30 some years while he was alive, only one gift. And when I put the whole picture together, it came to me. It's not always what you're told. Maybe it's one of these actions. I think my father always knew that I was a good student. He must have known that I was going to do something with the education. And by giving me this pencil sharpener, and this one actually is very similar to the one I had. This one I bought off eBay. But... I've been collecting these. I think I have four of these at home. It's a great reminder. So before this, when I was little in Korea, we would sharpen our pencils with a razor. But this, boy, this was a game changer for me. I might have been the only kid with one of these. You know, we didn't have TV. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We didn't have a refrigerator. But Chan had one of these. And I grew up in a little room where five of us slept, ate, and lived. It was a small room with linoleum covering, had no real furniture to speak of. But we had a dresser with four drawers. And imagine 10-year-old boy using a hammer and nails to put this on the top. And I remember getting yelled at because I would forget to clean up because this would leave all this black dust, right? But bless my father for giving me this gift. Somehow, that word Boston must have been chiseled into my brain because many years later, for the first time in 1989, I would come to Boston and never look back. So when I think about my father... My father, when he was in Korea, until he came to the United States, you know, he, I thought, was a big, muscular guy, even though he was a um, little technical difficulty here. So, oh, there we go. So my father, what I remember is, even though he was a little shorter than me, but I always remember him as a big, muscular guy, um, little... There you go. We are, we're back on. <clears throat> this happens. Thank God Mike is here. So when I was growing up in Korea, I remember my father as being that guy always dressed up, good-looking guy. He always smelled of aftershave, women, booze, and barbecue beef, maybe a combination of all of those. But I don't really remember having physical connection with him. I was always fearful. He was, first of all, he was hardly around, but a few times I saw him, I was fearful. But when he gave me this, man, Boston, for the next two years, I would cherish this gift. 
and I wish I had brought this from Korea. But for all I know, this is from Korea, right? Because eBay, they sell these from everywhere. But he was in his late 30s when he came to the United States, brought his wife and three boys. And about that age, in my 30s, I became a father for the first time. After finishing my residency at Boston City Hospital, in my late 30s, I became a father. Being a parent wasn't on my radar. Even though I had delivered many babies, it just wasn't something that I thought of. But I think all of a sudden, as I was approaching 35, 36, it became something that, hmm, maybe I should consider. And my first son came shortly after my 36th birthday. And did he change my life forever? Even though I have five kids. Yes, I have five kids. How many of you know have five kids? I don't know many, but I have five kids. Four amazing boys and one lovely daughter. The first one, however, I always say he's my favorite child. I mean, I say that because he changed me forever. How did he change me? Well, the responsibility of being a parent is so heavy, it's burdensome, it's good, bad, and ugly. In some ways, if young father understands what it takes, it may really push many potential fathers away from being one because it's a lot. But once I became a father, I understood what I had to do. And for someone like me where I didn't really have anything to go on, you know, it's not like I could talk about how I grew up with my father, things I did with my father, playing soccer, baseball, or the times I would go to him whenever I had issues or talk about what to do with my life. I didn't have any of that. But my father did give me this pencil sharpener, Boston brand. I got to Boston. So I always say, that old man, even though in many ways I don't have a lot of positive memories, this pencil sharpener almost wipes out all the negatives because I'm in Boston and I became a father, father of five. With my firstborn, I, I was like many typical immigrant parents, right? My first two who um, were a little older than my third one, I sent them to private schools, tutors. Imagine having tutors in elementary school. I did that, typical Korean. You know, it's all about get them ready, get them ready for those Ivy League schools. Heck, I'm in Cambridge, so I thought, you know what, they're going to have one tough decision to make. Do they apply to Harvard or do they apply to MIT, right? I mean, that's what I thought. So education with the tutoring, extra classes, even during vacation, I would give them things to do. If they get in the car, I would ask them, hey, I would give them math problems. I would ask them capitals. And, and then when they start playing sports, oh, you know, the first one wanted to play baseball. So, oh, he's going to go, maybe he'll go to major league. So I get him a private coach. And then he said, oh, I think I play basketball. Okay, he's going to go NBA. So I get him another coach. So sometime in high school, when it was time to really talk about what to do with college, we talk about, okay, you know, you got to do a few things to get into one of these schools. And I remember a few conversations we would have. He was, yes, okay. But I could see that lack of energy, not like how I was. And then one day he said, Appa, which means daddy in Korean, you know, you talk about applying to Harvard, MIT, that's your dream, not mine. Can you imagine? To an immigrant, your first child says, what? What do you mean? What do you mean it is not your dream? Because have you been to Harvard Square? Any time, any day, any season, you see all these buses with Asians coming off. They take pictures in front of Harvard, you know, Chinese, Koreans, others. 
because they all, oh, yeah, I've been to Harvard. This is where my so and so goes. I mean, this is this is the end point for many of us. I was no different. I worked very hard. Of course, my kids are going to go to top schools in the country and be a doctor, lawyer, whatever. And my firstborn says, no. No, I did not take that lightly. It took me a while to understand where he was coming from. And he was right. That was my dream. Like many immigrants. I mean, it's like when I went to Lexington today, holy smoke, I visited Lexington Recreation Center. Wow, I had no idea. So many Asian Americans. I wasn't sure where I was. It turns out any decent city with great education, that's, you, you find Asian Americans because that's where they moved to. So when my firstborn says such, it took me a while to really digest what he was saying. At some point, I realized he was right. You know, being a parent, it is really hard. But I understood where my son was coming from. Because happiness comes in many sizes and shapes. It doesn't really matter. What I ask my kids for is to be a decent person, be good to others, have good manners, and make sure you get four years of education. After that, what they do, it doesn't really matter to me. If my son wants to be, work at a recycling center, work as youth counselor, work as a waiter, bartender, or be a professional psychologist, therapist, it doesn't really matter because it is about his life. But I would also tell my son and others, you got to give us immigrants little time to digest this. Because for us, because we come from places where we had so little, we come to America, we say, this is a land of opportunity. There isn't anything one cannot do. With hard work, persistence, and a bit of luck, you can do anything. You can't even run for president. Anything. The gap is there for many immigrants and their kids. I see that all the time. It, it is sad to see that one article I read about MIT where unusually high number of Korean students committed suicide. You know, I cannot imagine what that's like for parents, family, and Narrowing that gap, I think, is very important for many reasons. One, the kids, they have to live out however they want to live. The other thing is, I don't want to be identified just as a father. I think there are a few things which identify as a person. If we are lucky enough to find just the right partner, then as a partner, married person, spouse. And as a parent, if you are lucky enough, to have one or five in my case, or as a professional, something, something that identifies purpose you serve. For me, the lessons my son taught me allowed me to deal with next four better. And it turns out, by doing so, they kind of figure out what they want to do. And you know what that has done for me? Has given me more time to work on myself because you know life is more than just being a parent and I am still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up at my age I'm trying to say gee what do I want to do when I grow up I'm a physician I'm doing this I'm doing that what do I want to do because in this country you can continue to have goals and pursue them. So any one of you out there who are immigrants or parents in general, when you're trying to raise your little ones, it's not just that role we must play. But having good communication with your kids, so vital. I mean, communication is everything. I talk about it with my patients. 
I want to make sure I am that physician who provides an outlet for my patients. And it took me a while to listen rather than talking, preaching to my kids. And what that has done also, our relationship, my relationship with my five kids, I cannot ask for anything better because we talk and I feel like they listen. And even though we have generation gaps, they actually talk about this and that. And I appreciate that. So having that two-way street of communication is so important in your relationship with your kids. Personally, it took me a while. I was stubborn old fart. I'm going to have five I have five kids. They will all go to Harvard, MIT, Yale, like my brother did. I, I'm not sure what, why it's a hard question, but I see that it wasn't always productive. Now, tonight's guest, Coach Bohan, actually coaches my two boys. I didn't really know much about fencing. I thought it was one of those romantic sports you only see in movies or Euro. But it turns out it's not just physical, but very cerebral. And I wanted my kids to be learning some kind of sports with discipline. So all my kids have taken, taken Taekwondo. And I insisted that if they're going to take Taekwondo, it must be taught by Koreans. Again, another stubborn trade of mine. And they did that. Fencing. I was fortunate enough to be in touch with Coach Bohan. Our path crossed. And I really want to hear about his life in Croatia, how he came to be in the United States, what to do with parents like me who thinks that their kid's going to go to Olympics through fencing. Very demanding parents. I'm joking. I don't expect my kids to go to Olympics. But having something like fencing with Coach Bohan is going to teach them good life skills that can apply to anything they want to do. With that, let me bring Coach Bohan on and talk to him. Coach, Coach Hello? Bohan, are you there? Yes, I am. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hey, Coach, you. how are you? Hi, <laughs> nice, sir. How are you? Good. How's family? Everything, Everything is lovely. Yeah. yeah. How's your wife? She's uh, she's uh, good. Good. A lot of a lot of work to do, so. She is usually nagging, though. But wow. that's life, I guess. <laughs> and how how are your three lovely daughters? Man, uh, what can I tell you? You deliver them. What do you well, expect? I yeah. didn't. <laughs> it is true. I was fortunate enough to be there for all three lovely yes, miracles, and I'm sure yeah. they're, you know, entertaining, right? Yes, yeah, sir. So far, everything that that you do uh, or touched so far uh, turned out to be extremely good <laughs> except me except me <laughs> though, so. <laughs> so coach bohan yes. is a former olympic fencer uh competed in 2012 represented croatia so tell us a little bit about your life in croatia take us through well, about your fencing and you know all that how much time how much time do we oh have? we have all night <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard well, you know, I come from Croatia. That was, um, you know, part of uh, ex republic called Yugoslavia. You know, and it was tough. I'm a, a war child. Not in the beginning, though, but later on, like with age of ten, it started war because of the separation of Yugoslavia all the way. And 
it's kind of a the the the, the beginning so it's kind of was going like this you know uh, in the beginning, I was in Yugoslavia. Until then, everything was good. And then war started. And then my father is a Serbian that lived in Croatia, which during the war that was very, very bad. Mm. Uh, I felt a lot of nationalism, a lot of kind of a racism on my back. Although, you know, fencing kind of, a, you know, moved me away from all of that. You know, I can tell you that. But all in all, I would say, it, it was it was a it was a nice memory. It wasn't too bad because it just I lived in the capital of of Croatia, which is Zagreb. It it got spared just a little bit of that, like the ultimate horrors of the war. Mm. Uh, but still, it, it 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 I believe made me stronger at some point. You know, honestly. So yeah, that's like in a short short version. If you have any questions, ask me. <laughs> so. Because of fencing, you must have started traveling around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll just say this. I followed my dream. I don't know why. I don't know how. My, my parents were extremely smart. And, 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 you know, it's kind of a... My mother didn't finish university, so she wanted me to finish university. My dad finished university, but he never got achieved by sports so he didn't care about university he wanted me to do sport you know mm. um in in the beginning i was a little bit you know lost uh, honestly i think that i started doing sports and i started being stuck in fencing because universities and studying was extremely bored for me mm. you know it was like something that needed a long time for me to achieve and i was kind of impatient to a point though because in fencing or the other sports you go over there if you're good you beat up everything right. like five minutes and you feel the the reward of your of your progress which is in a start like that when i was a kid and and honestly everything in my life that i i'll, I'll say mental mental stuff so my experience in life i can say i get rewarded through fencing Hmm. Because I, the first time in my life I, I left, I flew to Paris when I was 10 years old to a tournament, you know, in a war Croatia, hmm. there was like 91, 92. I mean, that kids over there couldn't even dream about it. And to some extent, I was at special because I was at Paris. Nobody didn't know, wow, man, right. go over there, though, you know. And you can have a contrast of it. Uh, I see I'm going to compare a lot of these things to my brother because this is kind of a two you know, similar images that you can actually see, you know, the contrast of it, what actually sport gave me in my life and basically took away from my brother, hmm. you know, uh, to the point that I actually left the, the States or whatever, you know, I had so much traveling experience and find myself so much in a, such a different situations and seeing stuff that, you know, all of this stuff that when you change so much your life and so much, you know, change the, 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 the how you say, the surroundings, everything didn't felt too hard on me. Mm. I'm going to say it didn't, though, but it didn't too hard. On contrary to my brother that basically, you know, didn't move from his neighborhood or his whole life. You know, mm. Even now, when I'm here and everything is settled, I invite him to come and he's like, you know, I'm not sure I can come. I'm afraid this and that, which is kind of ridiculous. So anyways, I start fencing. Uh took me through the school to university um, all the time university and school were second fencing was my first thing that I followed um, I was fortunate enough to have my dad that he was kind of a you know I'm not say he was he was doing well but he could provide me you know with a thing that I that he told me you just fence and don't think about anything else you know to some point and I, and I did it and I just fenced and I'll tell you one thing doc I so that's funny. I wasn't the best in fencing until I was 25. Hmm. So <laughs> that would tell me about about building characters, you know. I mean, people would, you know, with 20 years old, when I was already, my life was turning, either I'm going to left or right or what I'm going to do, I was like mediocre to lower level fencer, you know. And, you know, speaking of, you know, stubbornness and, you know, deciding and goal and follow my dream and being you know, like really strong into it, you know, I, I'm a pretty stubborn guy when I want something, when I enjoy something, you know. So was that uh, Olympic then, 20, 2012? You were uh, at the height yeah, of your career? I do. I do. Yeah, right. I have an Olympic tattoo. It's 2012 from London. So basically, I'll, I'll tell you like this. Um, 
fencing is divided through zones, okay? And Europe is the strongest zone because the oldest fencers and oldest fences, fence, fencing countries are from Europe. Italy, Russia, Germany, uh, France, England, and then smaller countries, Poland, Ukraine, Hungary, um, I don't know what else, you know, Belarus, Belarus, they have five-time world champion and so on and so forth, okay? So to qualify to Olympic Games from Croatia is next to judo or to wrestling, I'm not sure, is the hardest path in mm. the whole Olympic circuit from all the sports to qualify to Olympic Games. Because basically you go to one tournament where you're gonna where you're gonna become you're gonna be number one at that tournament and then you go to Olympic Games. Mm. And you compete like with all of these countries. Right. Almost all of these countries that I that I didn't already qualify for Olympic Games. Which is which is uh, uh, to, to that point I already have maybe around twenty world championships when i came to that tournament right. i was shivering like a little baby man i was right. this i was scared i was scared so much i cannot even explain you that mm. and i had a lot of a lot of experience with that though and then i achieved that and this is that that was the first time somebody qualified uh, to the olympic games in 75 years or so whatever from croatia and the first one from the new independent Croatia right. that was you know newly independent though so I'm basically the only Olympian from Croatia you know at that moment I think that achieved me and that become that that actually you know uh, gave me so much wings and I think this is my best uh, uh, best coaching value though that I can transfer that security and achievement on my to the students because when they see it and you know there, there, there isn't a single student in the United States that can come to me oh but it's hard I'm not sure I can do it. I said, man, I did it. That's so if right. I can do it, you can do it five times more because it's easier for you, though. And that gives a lot of, you know, wings to the kids and stuff, you know. So how do you go from Olympics to United States? Why eh, Why America? So now, so now we are going back all the way to that war and, you know, separation of all of that. My opinion is that, you know, Croatia is very, very uh, corrupted country. It's post, it's a new country. Mm. It's a post, post-communist country that there's a lot of stuff were happening. And basically, I, I honestly, in one word, I didn't have an opportunity. You know, I fenced my whole life for no money. And I came to the point that I was like really high in my life. I was hanging out with prime ministers and everything, but I didn't didn't see a future for me in order to survive in any way. You know, I could, you know, I mean, I, I would have maybe three, four hundred dollars salary monthly, and that would be it. You know, which was ridiculous. So how did you come to the United States? How did you? So I just so so in all my travels, I was. Only once in the United States, and that was in South Bend on World Championships in 2000 at Notre Dame. And um, I kind of liked the United States, you know, everything. I was young then. I was 20 years old, though, but I liked it. It was, like, all for me, you know, new, a lot of, like, materialistic stuff that had, back then I didn't understand too much, but it was very shiny for me. I liked it. And after that, I never entered the United States again just because there weren't any tournaments there. And it was always kind of for me, you know, I want to want to go there and want to feel it. I want to see how it is. And um, and then when I come to the lowest point in my life, that was with like 34 years of my life when I needed to decide what I'm going to do. My federation still wanted me to fence, but without the money, you know, because they didn't have it or they spent it on a political purposes for some other coaches, whatever. So I said, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go and, you know practice uh, you know practice for Rio but I'm gonna explore while I'm doing that making some connections and at least explore I'm just gonna actually exploit the sport first time in my life actually rather than sport exploiting me in order to you know see some things and I called my um, called my really good friend that is actually a, a two-time Olympian and 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 European champion Grand Prix winner which is actually my student now <laughs> as well uh, James Andrew Davis, which is a part of a Great Britain Olympic team, and he was already at back then at that moment in San Francisco, uh, fencing at uh, one club over there at, uh, at, uh, at San Francisco, and he actually helped me out kind of a, to 
to make connections to to find myself a first gig here in uh, here in Boston uh, through some guy that wanted to open up a club and, and that's how it started. And then you met your wife. And then yes, I was certain that something great is a, is, I, I, I'm 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 gonna get something hap something's gonna get happening in U.S. for me great. But didn't expect it's gonna come in that shape. Mm. <laughs> Meeting my wife, I thought I was like kind of a, wanted a hundred million dollars though. But I guess you know I should she be happy is, with this. <laughs> she's lovely. I mean, you you are but so lucky. She is so lovely, right? Smart, yeah, I guess, lovely. Man. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I'm I'm joking. I mean, you kind of came about in a roundabout way compared to some of us. Um, but now that you've been here, you live in America. And yeah. you didn't exactly come from a peaceful time. And I think even with the great support of your parents, wartime is wartime. It affects us, right? And I think that yeah, also yeah. helps us appreciate no. this country better. Even with what's going no, on, no. it makes you appreciate. What are, um, what is, when you describe to your family and friends in, in back home in Croatia, what, do you, what are some of the positive things you say about America? So the positive thing is, I honestly believe that there isn't a single person in the U.S. that cannot succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, where you are, so wherever you are, you are a beggar in front of the uh, supermarket, market basket, whatever. You are some clerk at, you know, bank or you work as a doctor, you can... From that point now where you are, you can succeed in whatever you want to do in your life or whatever. You can achieve your goal no matter what it is. You can do it. There is not but or maybe. You can do it 100%. Maybe you're not going to do it in a week or two weeks in a year, but you can do it 100%. That's, 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 the, that's, that I, that's the greatest thing about the United States. And I share that sentiment. I mean, this yeah, is a land of opportunity. And I think... It's hard for some people to hear us and say, wow, were you, I mean, because I'm not talking about, if someone is stuck, it is true, many people are stuck in this vicious cycle of poverty and uh, yeah. low-income housing and whatnot. But when you come from places, whether it's war or poverty or whatnot, you come here and you're like, whoa, like, what? what can you do? So I, I completely agree. What are negatives? I lost you there. Can you hear me? Huh? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. So let me just go back a little bit on that. So let's say, for example, somebody now, you don't have a job, and somebody employs you in $50,000 a year, let's say, okay? Medium, let's even less. One thing that you can count on, okay, you can get fired. That's true. Okay, but you're going to find another job. But why, one thing you can count on, if you work there for four months, three months, two months, one month, whatever it is, you can count on that you're going to get paid for it. Mm -hmm. Because country, basically country uh, makes it sure is, is protecting you in that order. Right. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of what happened in Serbia, which is the same shit, pardon my language, like Croatia. My father's best man, wife was working at a private company at that guy that was had come for 25 years and she went to retirement last year mm -hmm. that she found out that he didn't pay for 25 years of her uh retirement fund mm. and she can do nothing today right not speaking of thousands of the other uh uh people that they were working for two three years without a salary and then later on mm. they get lost they didn't get a salary okay so <laughs> you cannot top that, you know. <laughs> what about, I mean, what about some of the negatives? Negatives. Negative is, I'll tell you one thing, uh, is social quality of life. Hmm. That's a super negative. Um, I think the problem lies from the beginning when the kids actually get born. Mm -hmm. Okay. And parents are actually so busy chasing that dream. Mm. And so much that they negligent in their kids and kids are getting, you know, teached by ho homeschool. I think homeschooling 
I'm a coach. I had a couple of homeschool kids. I mean, I don't want to offend anybody's doing it, but please, people, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> please let kids go and socialize because no matter the degree that you're going to get, if he's not going to be a social monster, he's never going to succeed in life, you know, unless with, you know, doing online something thing. So I have a friend that is on a, that is, um, you know, Wall Street. He's CEO of one of the biggest investment firm and he finished Oxford and, you know, he's my great friend. He's Olympian as well in rower and, and I ask, and he says, man, nothing matters when you have 12 people in a room and they're all having the same suits look like the same. Right. doesn't matter if you finish Harvard or you finished, you know, nothing. The guy that is going to socially dominate over there and is going to give some, you know, special something, that's the one that is going to win in that particular point. You know? So, yeah, social quality of life, in my opinion, is 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 one big negative. And now then... I believe there is a, uh, you know, I've seen that everywhere, but I see that I think there is a, a lot of racism issues as well in the United States. It's never on the top. It's always below. It's under. You know, I've just started discovering it and started. I didn't see it for a couple of years, though. And I think, you know, that's actually the stuff that shouldn't be happening, you know. And, but social quality of life, I think, is number one thing that, 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 is, that is bad. Do you have parents who come to you and say, you know what, I want to send my kids to Olympic. I want to send my kids to Harvard, Yale on a fencing scholarship. Yeah, I do have. So motivated. I have. I have only. It's not me. Parents, it's not me. Except you. Except you. I'm. I'm speaking of majority, not the special individuals. Uh, mainly, kids are coming to fencing because of universities. Hmm. No, 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 that's the problem. Nobody doesn't follow their, 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 you know, their goals, their, their, uh, their dreams in the U.S. You know, they're all, I mean, I believe in conspiracy theories, so I'm really not a good guy to talk about it, you know, right. <laughs> but, you know, you know, it's kind of a, who says that school is going to provide you anything, you know, maybe you're going to, I mean, maybe you're going to get a little bit better, easier, but I think, you know, it's. For me, I think it's all uh, how you say it, the, the order of. I, I cannot remember the word, but I think somebody invented school. Somebody invented. They didn't like. We didn't born up. Oh, now let's go to school. It's there. You know. <laughs> it's you know, kind of. A, with the little experience I've had with fencing, I think biggest thing that I, I'm attracted to about fencing is discipline. I like discipline. Yeah. I like yeah. military. I, I believe in discipline. I think yeah. that my twin boys, when they are with you, they are trying to follow guidelines. They are doing their best. It's the discipline oh. they have to learn. For sure. And whether they continue fence or not, I think they can really apply that to anything in life. For sure. That's, that's mental, what I believe in. Men, Mental strength and mental stability is the greatest thing that you can get from fencing, regardless of anything else. When you come out of the fencing, you're going to be a really tough, mentally tough person, for sure. So you're my fourth person I've interviewed, and all of you are from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. All of us agree, including myself, five of us, that we live in a country with opportunities. And oh, yeah. it is really up to us individually to do something with it. Um, yeah. and, and I think that's that really separates us immigrants from people who are born here. I oh, think that's, it does, definitely. That's a big difference. And, I, and I, my kids will tell you that we, we don't see, when it comes to that particular subject, we don't see eye to eye. But yeah. I wanted to have you on today to really Thanks. showcase Croatia's proud son. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. We're so busy. This is about the only way I can see you without a mask. You see, I get yes, to see sir. I haven't yes, seen that sir. face. So say yeah. hello to your wife for me. But one thing that I would no. like to finish every segment is tell us something yes. in your native tongue, some words of encouragement to new immigrants. New immigrants? Oh, I have In your it. own language. Oh, Not my in own English. Language? Yes. Huh? Um Dođite u Ameriku i nemojte dvojiti sekunde da nećete uspjeti. Which means what? Which means 
one thing that I have, you know, I always, when I was coming to United States, I was, you know, coming in, I was having a lot of doubts if I'm going to succeed or not, if this is the right move or not. But now I see there, there wasn't a chance I wouldn't succeed. There wasn't a slightest chance. And I said to everybody, come to United States because there is not a chance you're not going to succeed. You know, Coach Bohan yeah. is humble because some of your students are already top ranked in the country. So I'm sure in the world of fencing, we're, we'll be seeing a lot of you. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, me. for inviting me. Before long, I'm coming to your house with a bottle of wine so we can have dinner. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting me. And um, yeah, I hope this show is going to be huge next David Letterman or something like that. So, <laughs> <you know. laughs> hey, you'll be invited again. Okay. All right, thank coach. You. Talk thank to you soon. Bye bye. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. So I, I would just want to say that again, you know, we had Brazilian, Russian, Dominicana, Croatian, myself. Um, one thing you hear from all of us is that regardless of what kind of background we are from, we are seeing opportunities and we see more positive than negatives when it comes to this country. That glass is half full. It's not half empty. In the coming episodes, I will have guests talking about different subjects. It's not always going to be about immig immigrants. But I want to thank all of you for positive feedbacks, and I'm learning. And because of what you've said, I'm going to change up with different subjects. Thank you so much. Until next episode, this is Bill Chan.